Hello and welcome back to Jump Chat. Um, I am your host, Reese, this week, and I have been joined by one of Jump Cut's editorial assistants. It is Audrey. Hello, Audrey. Hello. How are you? Not too bad. How are you? Yes, not bad at all, thank you. I'm enjoying my summer. Um, and you've got quite an exciting day ahead of you, haven't you, I believe? I do. Um, heading out in a little bit to see um, a press screening of the Suicide Squad, which is not here in the US yet, which is weird. But mm-hmm. yeah, I understand you, you guys have all seen it already. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as a little bit of a plug for the site, we do have a full podcast coming out this Friday all about uh, Suicide Squad. So hopefully that will kind of sync nicely with our release schedule. If not, I do apologize to Sam and Tom and everyone else. Um, but anyway, so today we're not here for the Suicide Squad. We are here to talk about uh, the recently released Old, the brand new film from M. Night Shyamalan. Um, as you know from films such as The Sixth Sense, from Signs, Unbreakable, Split, The Village. He has a very wide career. Um, and I think this film is very much a return to the classic style that we're used to from him. Whether that's good or bad, I think, is up to, or up for debate, I suppose. Um, so we'll go spoiler-free, first of all. Um, Audrey, what were your thoughts on Old? You know, I he gets a lot of guff from people about his filmmaking. Mm-hmm. Um, I like that when you go into one of these movies, you kind of know what to expect. I think it's... It's fun to see, you know, quote, original filmmaking. I know this was based on a graphic novel, but, like, it's still, Mm -hmm. it's not part of a franchise. It's not a sequel. It's not, you know, any of that stuff. Um, So I really enjoyed it. I thought it was was just a a nice, you know, breath of fresh air. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I thought it was cool. I thought it was fun. Beach is really pretty. You know, maybe I wouldn't vacation there, but still cool. Yeah, I think I'm. I feel similar in that I'm very glad I saw it. Um, I thought it was very engaging, almost throughout. I think I have issues with the ending, which we'll, we'll discuss at some. Oh, point. we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but I did enjoy. It. I thought the performances were actually quite good. You know, from Vicky, if I say it wrong, c- c- creeps, Vicky crepes. I don't know. Um, I thought she was very good. I thought Rufus Sewell was nicely kind of cartoonishly evil. I thought Thomas and Mackenzie was very good. I just, I thought, you know, the whole kind of the cast were on board with it. You know, they really got into the idea and they really sold this quite traumatic experience really, really well. And I know it's had a lot of criticism for some of the kind of dialogue and the delivery. But I, I was quite sold and I was quite invested in the, in, uh, the whole <laughs> proceedings on the beach. But like you said, the beach was really nice and it was very kind of nicely shot at various points. I just think... I had issues with the way that it unfolds. Would you agree or disagree? Um, I mean, I guess my issues with it primarily are dialogue related. Mm-hmm. Um, we can also say maybe, um, I guess, I don't know if it's, if it's the way it unfolds, but maybe it's, it's more the internal logic of it and then okay. the ending. Um, those would be my big three if we had to... I mean, I still liked it, still had fun, would would probably watch it again once it's, like, on TV. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, those, I think, would be my big three concerns. I think it does have that quality of... it's. I think it's quite fun to watch with some friends, you know? You, you can get quite involved in it, and it's quite a fun story to try and unpack and figure out, oh, what is the secret twist, as with all Shyamalan films? And I think that has definitely some kind of rewatchable, rewatchable value, I suppose. But I don't know. I just have lots of thoughts on it. <laughs> I I, it's hard it, to talk about without, yeah, without going into spoiler territory. Yeah. So before we get the spoilers, why not kind of do a quick, would you recommend this to the audience? Would you say it's, yes, it's worth to watch, yes or no? Oh, yeah. It's, it's fun. Like, I think you will have fun watching it. Um, you might get frustrated at points, but like, he takes you along with him, and even if you're disagreeing with choices that he's making, it's still an entertaining ride. Yes. I would agree with that. I think I saw one of my favourites, Mark Kermode, he said that the film very much toes a line, and you will either go with it, or you will think this is complete toilet. 
and I went with it just about, but it was very much kind of on the borderline, you know. So it's a, it's going to divide audiences. They already has divided audiences, um, but we'll we can discuss kind of what we thought in more detail now. Um, so the beach, man. That beach. It, <laughs> <laughs> it's madness. Um, I want to say first off, I think the strongest bit is the bit when you are on the beach and you don't know what is going on and you're just experiencing it at the same time as our characters. Would you agree? Yeah, I think that part is good. I think it's... it's I, it, That's the part that I think is probably rewarding on a rewatch to see like the mm-hmm. little indicators within each of the characters that mm-hmm. stuff's happening with them. Um, but yeah, I... Yes, I I agree. I think that that part, like the slow burn, um, is really engaging because then I think you get to the point, like where I was saying with the dialogue, where the mother says, "I am a curator in art museum in an art museum. I'm telling you this so that you'll take me seriously and know that I'm not just freaking out about this." And I'm like, that is not a thing. That is That's you being a curator. Speak. Yeah, look, first of all, it's not how people speak. And second of all, like <laughs> you being a curator of an art museum is not like a steadfastly, you know, notably men- mentally healthy career where mm. it's just like, oh, this person's a curator. I better take them seriously. They're definitely not yeah. crazy. It's like, well, no, that's not a real thing. So But it's also funny how she used her knowledge as a curator to understand how bones would deteriorate over time and i'm thinking that is a stretch considering you you just figured out that the beach ages things quickly like you yeah. made a very rapid uh, judgment on the situation here and just I based on your museum history you if know? you were gonna be an expert in something that would help you like we're gonna go out and give you a career a curator i don't know it has like <laughs> extensive archaeological like no a background i think you could just maybe say she's an archaeologist and not really have yeah. to go into like I'm a curator at this art museum. It's so strange. He does things but, with the dialogue where he like explains things that just don't need to be said. I think mm-hmm. so. Mm-hmm, definitely, I think he finds he finds ways for every character to introduce themselves. Both what is their career and what is their illness in some very convoluted way, which I thought was really funny all the way through. Yes, I lo- I like that because it also was like call, call back to the. You know, the little boy asking people, like, what's your name? What's your occupation? Yeah. And that's basically what he's doing. Boy. Yeah, that's yeah. that's just him. That's a fair point. That's quite a nice kind of analysis, I suppose. Maybe <laughs> he, that's just the way M. Knight d- writes stories is that he thinks, what would a six-year-old boy ask? And just focuses <laughs> on that. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. So I want to, to kind of dive into the more finer details of this plot so obviously the beach has a very mysterious force within it i suppose that makes everything on the beach age very rapidly yeah over the space of, like magnetic kind of rocks or something i don't know yeah Is they that... try to explain it and <laughs> i don't want to go into the science of it because i don't think that's the focus i think it's just this exists but we move on from it you know i think the focus is why they're there but before we get to the why they're there I want to address the choice he makes with the the young son and the young daughter. Do you know what I'm referring to? Um, please elaborate. I'm not sure exactly. So, at the start of the film, the, the, the son is, what, kind of maybe six years old. And then there is another kind of mother who has a daughter who's like three. And over the course of time at the beach, they do both get older and they both get to age, let's say, 15 in the space of four or five hours oh right and then they bone and then they bone and then <laughs> she gets pregnant and yeah. then they have that horrible delivery scene where the Wild. baby dies because it wasn't fed which like, is my okay internal logic if the baby is dying from not well i guess it's it's like failure to thrive like that nobody paid yeah. attention to it because it was put down for a minute which is like yeah. months or whatever in their time mm-hmm. but if that's the case, like if, if if every single minute is a microcosm of several months, mm-hmm. how are they alive if they're not eating every twenty seconds? Well, that's exactly it. That I think they there are a few very severe logical jumps that you have to make to justify how they're not dying on the spot. Yeah, I mean, like I don't want to be a I don't want to be a cinemasins person <laughs> and like 
tearing it apart. That was just something that, like, because they did that with the baby, I think it introduced mm-hmm. an element of, like, where you could question. <laughs> like, wait. It did. <laughs> it definitely did. But I think my issue with it is, why did he make her be pregnant? Like, why make the baby child pregnant? That really did not sit right with me at all. Like, why not have a character, let's say the mum of the, of the, kind of the, the girl, for example, that she finds out she's pregnant at the start of the film, and then she has a rapid pregnancy on the beach, you know? That is a natural thing to happen. Why are you making a child grow up really fast and then make the child give birth? Like, that is, in my head, excuse my language, really fucked up. <laughs> like, really like, fucked up. You know, it's an indictment of society. Like, kids are made to grow up too fast. I don't know. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think, I mean, first of all, like, in the, I've read the graphic novel, and it is in the graphic novel that that happens. Um, oh. Also, a lot more nudity in the graphic novel. Their swimsuits do not fit the entire time, and they don't have, like, conveniently oh, no. backups of, you know, all of the clothes that will fit the older versions of people. Anyway, side note. Not important. Um, yeah, I think it contributes to, like, the seriousness of the situation that mm-hmm. this kid is. And, I, I mean, I think they do a good job of indicating throughout the film that as the kids age, they their mental age is increasing, too. Because I think I would have had a lot more of an issue with it if they had made her seem a lot more childlike as a teenager. But right. she seems like she's... I, it's horrible to talk about this like just saying <laughs> words about this is, feels mm-hmm. gross but mm-hmm. I think they, they do enough to make her not feel like a young child that it didn't for me set off my like oh my god this is screwed up like switch I in have. my brain but I could see why it would I had alarm bells man it was really dark <laughs> just, it was just really horrible um and like I, I did appreciate what he was doing with, like you said about how they they do mentally age as well, in that there was a nice, there were some really nice scenes in it, like when Maddox, which is Thomas and McKenzie's character, talking to mid-sized sedan, which is one of the worst character names of all time. I know he plays a rapper, but I mean mid-sized sedan. Yeah, really? and I mean like that's the joke, but we can talk about how poorly he is treated in this film. <laughs> yeah, we'll get, we'll get to him. But I just I just want to address that there was I really liked the way that Maddox described her brain growing up was like she sees more colors now, which I thought was was quite a nice sentiment to kind of illustrate how she is aging rapidly. And I think mm-hmm. that was quite nicely handled. And I think Mackenzie as well delivers it really nicely. She gives a really good, really kind of quite touching performance in a surprisingly kind of very you know out there film and she kind of grounds it in this this is actually quite a traumatic experience that she is growing up all too quickly and i think that was a nice moment in a very bizarre film yeah she's so good and i i do really really like that descriptor that idea of like you know brain development and getting older you know seeing nuances and things that you didn't before um Mm -hmm. I also think her her character is so interesting because she has kind of like the caretaker role as a child because she sort of protects her little brother um Mm -hmm. and then that kind of expands as as she is getting older um because she's taking care of her parents through throughout most of it like he's kind of off you know having sex with the little the other little girl whatever um but (laughs) she's the one who's like actually there trying to like help them and she's stuck kind of in between yeah in like childhood and adulthood so i think her it's interesting yeah um, you brought up mid-sized sedan. What did you think was the issue with his characterization? I suppose in this film, I think it's a double whammy of you introduce a, a violent, mentally ill stereotype, mm-hmm. and then you use it for racism. <laughs> like, I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't love how that all played out. Um, like, mean with um, Rufus Sewell's kind of... Yeah, because he's yeah, supposed yeah. to be like a paranoid schizophrenic. Never mind the fact that people with schizophrenia tend to be less violent than the general population. Mm. I This is a soapbox that I like to stand on a lot because I have family <laughs> members with this illness and I hate right. when, when movies do that where they're like, well, let's just throw in the crazy person and make them violent. Mm. It's like, well... Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of my... my um, complaint about that aspect yeah i mean you, you do have a kind of more of a personal connection to it i did think 
I thought there were a few characters that were very weirdly portrayed. And I think mid sized Sedan didn't get much chance to develop as a character, really, compared yeah. to, say, Thomas and Mackenzie. You know, he was just, let's all assume that he killed this girl at the beach at the start. And I'm thinking, hold on, you don't know this guy. Like, what? why are you all suddenly gang up on him? Very strange. Yeah, and, like, for long stretches of the film, they just, like, leave him off to the side. And, like, nobody mm-hmm. thinks about him, nobody talks to him. It's just like, okay, we're not, uh, you know, we're not associating with him. It's weird. It is very strange. Um, Let's talk about the ending. Yes, let's do it. it's, it is, it's, again, choices are made in this film. They are. And this is the big one. Because I think, for me, it's a very anticlimactic, underwhelming twist. Because I know he likes to include a twist. And this one just didn't have the same impact as his other twists for me. It was just like a bit of a letting a balloon out of air slowly, you know? Yeah. I, okay, I've given it a lot of thought. And Mm -hmm. for me, what frustrates me is that they have that scene on the beach where it's, we're full spoiler now, right? I can detail stuff. Oh, yeah, complete okay. spoilers. Okay, yeah. so so there's the scene on the beach where it's just the two kids left, and they're now in their 50s, and they say, should we still try to get off the beach? Yeah, but let's build a sandcastle first. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, my God, that is a beautiful metaphor for life. Like, none of us are getting off this beach. We're all on the beach. We're here until we die. There's no escape. But you've got some time might as well build a sandcastle might as well have mm-hmm. do something fun spend time with your family build something beautiful like mm-hmm. oh chef's kiss love it beautiful <laughs> metaphor for life but then wait no there is an escape we can't escape there's coral <laughs> so i was like oh you just under you just like you know cut the legs out from under this mm. this metaphor that you built because i get that like having them escape is the catharsis they have you know that's you feel good because you're like oh i was rooting for those kids and they got off the island but from a narrative perspective you just like screwed the thing that you were building your entire film around yeah you undercut kind of the actual metaphor for what the beach stands for and yeah yeah i do get that but i think my issue with it was the reveal of the whole medical reasoning for it like it just it, it tries to paint it as being quite optimistic even though we've just watched 12 people die quite horribly. Like, so for the ones who are maybe watching this just to see what gold is like, haven't seen the film yet, I suggest watching it because it is madness. But the ending effectively is the scientists have discovered an area of a beach that is has magnets and rocks and coral on it that for some reason impact the flow of time. And it makes people age very quickly over the space of a very short space of time. And what scientists have done is they use this beach to kind of trial their new medication um, for all these kind of different um, conditions. So everyone on the beach has some sort of medical issue. Someone's got epilepsy, someone's got hypocalcemia, hemophilia, all that kind of stuff. And then at the end, you discover that, oh, yeah, these kind of this medication did actually work because the one with epilepsy survived for 16 years in real time without having an epileptic fit and i'm thinking cool what else (laughs) that was it i just thought what there's got to be more to it than this you know surely yeah i mean it helps them test the efficacy of their drugs and long and you know over the course of several years which i guess is a is a godsend but it seems like this is an awful lot of trouble and expense to go to to yes. test seven people and also like the whole point of science is that your tests need to be like you need to be able to replicate them so mm-hmm. it's like okay you found something that worked for epilepsy in one person um how many more people are you going to have to send to the beach with epilepsy mm-hmm. before you can you know go by these by by it just it doesn't seem scientifically rigorous to to no. to my mind um but I, you know, like, I guess I didn't think of it as super optimistic because, like, they do end up getting arrested at the end. And so it is kind of so. like, no, this is a bad thing. Like, we know they have noble intentions, but, like, this is still bad. Um, which that's a- true. Actually, 
I this is something I didn't mention before, but a thing that I actually really liked about this movie is that they had the two actors as children, the two actors as as sort of teenagers, and then the two actors as middle-aged people rather mm-hmm. than trying to age up Thomas and Mackenzie and Alex Wolf with yeah. age makeup. I I mm-hmm. I was cuz I I so many movies would do that and I was really mm-hmm. glad that they cast like two really good actors in their 50s yeah. to play those cuz I I I liked them at that age. Like I was like, "Oh, I'm still invested in you even though we just did a, a last minute switch of actors with mm. 10 minutes left I in think- this film." Yeah, that final scene I think was definitely fed by the realization that it was oh my god, Miss Honey! Like I thought, oh my god, she's in it, and that really kind of carried me through the last scene because it felt like they were about five endings, and it was just like, oh, can I ask? Because you've read the Sandcastle graphic novel, mm-hmm. is the same end the medical ending? Is that the same thing as the story? No, 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 it's totally different. Ah. Um, spoilers for Sandcastles. Um, mm-hmm. They basically everybody dies. Um, they they sit around the fire at night and then when the the baby earlier did not die so okay. so the baby is still there but like so they're all they all they all go to sleep around the fire and everybody dies except for the baby who's the youngest and it's it's just like a middle-aged person kind of like walking around the beach by themselves there's no indication of like what caused it it was just oh. sort of like I think the book tries to be much more of, like, what I was saying before, just a metaphor for life. Like, mm-hmm. this is just what it is. Um, yeah, there's no explanation of what caused it, and there's no medical drama at the end. So, well, I'm, too far, I'm glad that, Sh- you know, Shyamalan did try something. Like, he added his own, his own spin to the ending, which I think if it ended in, like, the way that you just described, that would be much more frustrating for me. Because I do like to have some sort of answer. Because at least, you know, maybe I don't like the ending that we were given. But at least the story has an ending, you know? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I feel like, you know, you if you are going to go that route, you have to really lean into, like, you know, the thoughtful, metaphorical aspect of it. Where it's like, this is just life. Um, <laughs> so cause I, I think he tries to split the difference where he has like the people looking over the cliff with the binoculars on and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, I think it I, I could perfectly easily see a version of this movie that does end with the sandcastle scene where they're just like, mm-hmm. yeah, but let's try. Let's build a sandcastle first. Um, but it's it's not as it's yeah, it's it's probably pretty depressing, first of all. And then. Yeah, for people who want there to be an answer, it doesn't give you one. So. I know. But then, how, the way you just described it, I think there is quite a nice, optimistic, hopeful tone to it if you end it with having built the sandcast and then see them kind of swim away. And you're thinking, did they get out? Did they not get out? Like, you could create your own kind of ending if it did end at that point. It doesn't. But I think there is there is definitely legs in having that kind of ending to it, to be fair. Yeah. If you're I... committed to it. I also think with M. Night, it's sort of like an Alfred Hitchcock situation where he starts putting, Alfred Hitchcock does his cameo in every single movie and he starts doing Mm -hmm. it immediately because he knows people are just going to be watching the movie waiting for his cameo. Yeah. In that sort of sense, I feel like M. Night, if he didn't do a twist ending, I think people would be completely wrong footed at this point. Mm -hmm. Like they would be like, wait, I don't know what's happening. I'm expecting a Mm -hmm. twist. So. And he can't help himself though anymore. I don't think. Like, even I think one of his best films in recent years was probably Split, which I was really surprised by. I think that was you know really sold by James McAvoy's performance and Anya Taylor Joy as well. And I think that film ends at a certain point. You're thinking, yeah, that was just a very solid kind of weird superhero-ish story to to end on. But then he just chucks in that little diner twist at the end. I'm thinking, was that needed? I know it did lead up to a, another film, but I'm thinking, why not just tell one story without having a twist? Do you have to always give us a twist, Mr. Shyamalan? Is it always necessary? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I think he just likes it. I think he is a very... Like, you know, he, he writes and he finances and he directs his own movies, so it's very much based on his whims. And I think this is the kind of storytelling that he enjoys... And mm-hmm. so he's just like, this is what I'm going to do, like it or not, still going to be number one at the box office. Because <laughs> um. <laughs> it did do well. It, it did, it did, it did well. well in the first week. 
I think it's it's made all of its budget back, and I think a little bit more, which is good. Yeah. So I mean, which is more they could have asked for. Yeah, one hundred percent. It don't, totally made back its own budget, and not for nothing. But this is why you should make movies that cost twenty million dollars because it's not yeah. you know this huge burden to to make your money back. Like I think the mid budget adult movie has just been massacred and it's like Mm -hmm. there's a reason why you make these kinds of movies because it's like you you will have some audience and if it's remotely good like it's not it's not a risky venture you know you see so many of these movies that have these inflated hundred million dollar budgets and that not even just superhero movies but just like Mm. other movies that for some reason need to cost that much and it's like they don't make it just just commit to like a slightly lower budget and it'll be much easier mm-hmm. for you so i know you're setting yourself up for a fail if you the bigger the budget goes the more trouble you're gonna have if it doesn't make any money back whereas making a film on 20 million is thinking this is a very low kind of consequence venture and then it's you know it's created discussion people are still talking about it it was mean to death last week like that's what modern discourse is like and i think old is going to stay in the conversation because it was low budget and yet it did well at what it wanted to do it set out to do a certain thing and it did it whether you like it or not as if it matter entirely but it Shyamalan, yeah. i think created the film he wants to create you know and i think we should definitely be celebrating that achievement of his that he's done with this film 100 percent, and you know 20 million is not nothing i've worked on movies that have like <laughs> like feature-length movies that got theatrical releases that cost like three million dollars and mm. so it's like, you can do a lot with $20 million. I don't know, who, like, what accountants are handling these $100 million movies, but, like, none yeah. of them need to be that expensive, except for, like, <laughs> a Marvel movie. Yeah, all the all the massive, like, superhero ones, yes, you know, because you can take the risk there because you know it'll make the money back. Whereas, yeah, I agree with you. The films need to be cheaper. Yeah, and then people complain, they're, they're like, oh, how come this movie failed? Does that mean nobody wants to see adult, like you know just traditional adult dramas anymore and it's like no we want to see them it's just not enough people want to see them to justify a hundred million dollar budget come on exactly but i think if the, if films are good people will see them you know like it's a very simple concept and yet people don't see that yeah yeah i mean i think there's like a limit to what a certain type of movie can achieve i think it, i mean there are exceptions obviously there are you know, really straightforward dramas that don't cost a lot of money and then they, they connect with an audience and they, they go mm. off at, you know, break box office records. But I think, you know, you have to be realistic about what you're making and, like, what its return will probably be. And it's like, I don't know why they can't make the math line up and just realize, like, oh, this isn't going to be financially viable. So, yeah. silly. But then, what was, like, the last film? This is obviously a major question. If you don't know the answer feel free to not answer it <laughs> but i'm thinking you know what was the last film that didn't cost more than 100 million that made like a loads of money was it something like get out because that was quite cheap wasn't it and it made absolute bank that's because... a yeah that's a good shout um get out is probably one of the most recent ones um mm. that that probably made a ton of money i feel like that movie cost maybe like eight million dollars i'm guessing yeah. that but it was I, I think that was a pretty inexpensive movie um, it's just, I, I think it's very strange that, you know, films that cost less money are then expected to make less money. And I'm thinking, yeah, but why not, though? Why can't these films that cost $20 million make $40 million at the box office? You know, why are people kind of limiting its reach? It's well, I think so- it's it's partially, you know, if you have less money, you have less money to spend on advertising, getting movies into, yeah. into theaters. Marvel movies are in super wide release, which is, I think, over 4,000 screens across, yeah. the, just in the United States, 4,000 screens, um, which means, you know, if you have that many, and they they have, like, you've seen the day a Marvel movie's released, how many screenings they have, there's, like, one every 15 minutes, there, yeah. <laughs> they they overload it, um, so it's it's just a money generator, like, you have it in that many theaters, it's it's accessible to everybody, Whereas smaller budget movies, it's harder to get into screens. You know, you maybe have 900 screens and that's that's a pretty decent, that's an okay mm. release. Um, and it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's just logistics. It's it's harder for it's for smaller movies to make that big of an impact unless they have really great word of mouth or like a really successful awards campaign. And then they get a boost from that. But 
it's yeah it's it's harder um and i don't think it's necessarily people dictating like this costs less money which means it will make less money i think it's just a, a reality yeah, limited but yeah. yeah that's fair so. we went off track there but <laughs> it was a nice conversation um i think that does kind of sum up our thoughts on old have you got any final thoughts on it or are you happy to kind of end it there because it was an intense film it's an intense film a lot of roving camera work just kind of circling mm. um i enjoyed it you know it, like it, it's it's a it's a good fun summer movie i i don't i think if you if you want it to be super philosophical you might be disappointed by the end but i think if you're willing to go along for the ride then it is a hundred percent worth seeing i agree I mean, like i said earlier i think it's the kind of film that you will either go with it or you will not go with it i'd say try to go with it just see where the film takes you and i think it's very much worth experiencing let's call it that um yeah um so i'll I'll call it there for our episode of jump chat today uh thank you very much audrey for joining me today have you got anything to plug where can we find you all of that good stuff um i don't know if i have anything specific to plug but you can always find me um on jump cut and um also on twitter at the audrey fox that's me thank you very much um i'll just quickly plug our patreon of course um this episode will uh, always or any jump chat episode always goes up a week before it goes out to general release so you can see hear these thoughts kind of much earlier than everyone else so if that interests you you can head over to our patreon via our website at jumpcutonline.co.uk and you can subscribe for one pound and you get access to loads of cool things like you get free magazines and all sorts it's, it's, it's a very good deal um, so if you want to check that out, please do so at jumpcottonline.co.uk. Um, once again, thank you for joining me, Audrey. I have been Reese, and I will see you on the next one. Thank you, and goodbye. <laughs>